Hello and welcome to Bondcast, a podcast series where we discuss our views on the latest themes and events shaping rates markets. I'm Imogen Bakra, UK rate strategist, and I'm joined today by our global market specialists, Giles Gale and Jan Nabruzzi. Another super volatile week in markets, um, but we're recording this on Wednesday afternoon, straight after the uh, US inflation print, which has been driving a lot of the price action this afternoon. So I think it makes the most sense to start there uh, and start with you, Jan. Perhaps you can just give us a quick um, overview of, of what the print was and, and the, the details of that print. Sure. Um, we had another month where inflation sort of came above expectations. And I'll focus more on the core component, which excludes food and energy, just because uh, the headline number, which includes energy, did fall. And it's going to show uh, kind of like the slowdown because energy prices have uh, have been coming down, but they're super volatile. So, uh, And the Fed is going to be looking at the core components anyways. Uh, that is kind of not necessarily good news for the Fed. Like I said, it came at 0.6 close to, it's a soft 0.6, just, so, just over a, a 0.56 line to get a little uh, nitty gritty, but uh, that comes above expectations of 0.4 uh, for the month and still shows that there is momentum behind inflation. And if that wasn't bad, the components that made up the increase also are not really looking good for, for the central bank because uh, pretty much the stuff that you want to kind of moderate show the acceleration, things like rent and other services, uh, airfares, maybe something that the Fed can look past, but not so much the rental component. So, so that's not good news. And what I think the implications there are, uh, the, yes, there's going to be another inflation number before the June meeting, and we still haven't changed our view for a 50 basis point hike at the June meeting, but the rhetoric definitely will return about the potential increase again to up to 75 in July. Uh, I've no doubt we're going to see uh, local Fed presidents coming out publicly kind of discussing that they might be need to do more. They're going to be data dependent. And Justice Powell said that we're not, they're not actively discussing 75 uh, I think they will now actively be discussing 75. We'll see the next inflation number. They have a, it comes right before the Fed meeting. So that's unfortunate news for them, I guess. But we think June is too soon to change it, change it up yet. Uh, unless next month also, also shows another uh, acceleration, which would be really troubling by any means. Uh, but otherwise, 75 is definitely back on the table for, um, for the July meeting. So we've talked on this podcast before about how, you know, for the first time in a long time, you guys went neutral and then actually bullish, um, I guess, longer end treasuries. But a large part or a large driver of that view had been that you felt like we kind of reached peak hawkishness in the US versus perhaps UK and Europe, where we've been talking a lot about how, you know, too much has been priced in into the front end of curve. So how does that leave your view around peak hawkishness now being priced in? And, and how does your, I guess, Fed view fit with, with market pricing? And, and well, this is like a three part question. <laughs> what does that mean for, for longer end rates as well? Yeah, I can. Uh, I guess I'll kind of go over the curve and what we think. Uh, start from the very front end. One thing that really surprised me about the inflation number was uh, that we didn't necessarily see a massive repricing in the very front end. So like the June, July, September meetings. But what we saw was a little bit lower down the curve, kind of like the two-year point where uh, the terminal, the, how far the markets think the Fed's going to go as opposed to how fast got shifted higher. Uh, the logic behind that could be because because the reasons I discussed earlier what drove inflation. So it was uh, things like rent, which tend to be a little bit stickier as opposed to uh, used cars or airfares, which you can kind of look past as uh, seasonal ebbs and flows and uh, really driven by input cost. So maybe that was one of the reasons why kind of the two-year part of the curve underperformed. And uh, so that is also one point of the, of the treasury curve where we kind of you know, still suggest staying clear of not going to longs. The carry is attractive, yes, but there's still the risks of a uh, of a hawkish repricing from the Fed, just like what's happening today with inflation. On the other hand, a little bit uh, further down the curve, I don't think uh, high inflation numbers today should mean uh, you know higher, well, kind of ten year yields, at least not in uh, not in nominal space, because. Uh, the Fed will have to react more and more to each of these stronger prints. And if that comes at the cost of kind of hard landing the economy, even though they're looking for a soft-ish landing, uh, I think 
if expectations should expectations start going up uh, from where they are now, the Fed will consider upping up the antis, and with that comes kind of like a flattening or even re reinversions of the curve, and you see uh, the ten-year point kind of outperforming in our view. That being said, uh, it's important to point out that uh, liquidity, as it has been uh, discussed uh, widely recently. It, it is pretty thin. So even directional views, even if they're right, on the, uh, the theme underlying them ha doesn't change. It is hard to stick to them because uh, last week when we were commenting about the 10-year yield uh, kind of being too uh, too cheap in our view, and then the, the yields just ripped by another 10 base points, briefly touched 3.2% without any apparent catalyst in the background, and then came right below 3%. Uh, and these are really gappy moves without too much underlying demand or kind of like supply. Uh, so it just makes hard to stick to those positions, especially for kind of mark-to-market -market books. But over the next couple of months, we do see 10-year yields kind of continuing to grind lower, sub 3%. Yeah, that duration pool has been a tough one over, well, where it's certainly you and I, Jan, aren't used to these kind of volatile markets with such big moves every day. Uh, okay, with that then, let's move over to Europe, Giles, because uh, we're also seeing a huge amount of volatility there, and a lot of that is being led by uh, central bank speak. We well, we touched on this in last week's podcast as well, that a lot of hawks have kind of come out and put July on the table. Um, since then, we've had doves, and I guess most importantly today on Wednesday, we've had Lagarde do the same. So um, is it July? Um, and I guess more, well, for the first hike that is, and perhaps more importantly than just the timing of the first hike, do you still think markets are mispriced in how much they're expecting, say, for the rest of this year and, and next year too? Okay, so the first thing to say is, yes, we have started to see the doves shifting. And this is something that we touched on you know, a couple of weeks ago, at least. I mean, it's been in the air for a while, to be honest with you, this shift. I mean, you, know, uh, you always wonder when you, you know, you're at a turning point, you, know, you hear from the doves or the hawks, the hawks in this case, and the doves are all, are all silent, you know what's going through their mind are they just sort of trying to figure out you know, they, they, they just they just need to leave some thinking space so that they don't come out come across as flip-floppers when they <laughs> change the message or, or or you know what what exactly is going on there um you know it's it hasn't been you know a, a wholesale kind of you know, capitulation but there has clearly been a shift and i think it is absolutely clear that for most people um you know, july is not only on the table it is actually their base case unless of course there is a marked slowdown between now and and then and to be honest with you i would say that's actually quite a big if um so i think the base case is that july is when we see rates rising and no, I think that, that that makes a certain amount of sense. The ECB knows that it has quite a lot of work to do, no matter what, almost. And so getting in a first move and then, you know, what Christine Lagarde said this morning in you know, a reasonably clear signaling of um, of this July timing. You know, I mean, while it's 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 on the table, it's kind of more than just on the table. It's sort of on the table, and you know, the evidence has to be pretty strong to to get it off again. I think um, you know, she she said that thereafter rate rises will be you know, uh, what's the language moderate. Uh, no, Anyway, it'd be moderate, um, uh, yeah, and I, I don't think that that is something that they are willing to define for us just yet. Um, up, to, up to us to decide whether that means every quarter, whether it means every meeting, uh, uh, whether it means some kind of ad hoc mix between there. But listen, markets are not that far off pricing in three and a half rate hikes for this year, and there are only four. For them to, to, to move in. So, you know, I do think that there is enough that can go wrong about the, you know, on the real economy side um, with everything that we all know about um, that's you know, scaring markets and you know, it's a bad environment for risk at the moment for that not to, uh, to, to 
to happen at that rate. Then looking ahead to next year, we've got, you know, it's come down a little bit. We've got about 100 basis points priced in. You know, that, to be honest with you, looks pretty reasonable to me. Um, but I would say that the risks at this stage are maybe skewed towards less rather than more. You mentioned there about risk, and perhaps I'll come back to that in a second because I want to talk about that. But just, I guess, from a, a, the perspective of Italy, then, if we are talking about rate hikes, you know, potentially rate hikes sooner than we're expecting, you know, we think two this year, maybe four next year. How does that leave your view on Italy? And, you know, where we have heard so much from, from ECB speakers over the last couple of weeks, arguably they've been relatively quiet on the kind of fragmentation side of things and, and talking around how they might support spreads in that way. So what's your view there? Well, okay, so you know, I, I, I went through the analysis again in quite a lot of detail um, at the end of last week, uh, actually after, I think, recording the, the podcast. And you know, as often happens when you're you know, when you're going through and you're you know, you're sort of setting out what the way that you think about things again in the light of you know, the the new and new analysis, but also just getting your you know, so, so, so laying out the 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 arguments in black and white. You know, you you discover what you think, and actually, um, you know, whilst I'm not particularly concerned about the long-term debt fundamentals for, for Italy. Um, I, I do think that it's going to be quite challenging for, for Italy over the next few months because they're a little bit behind in their funding for the year compared to where you would normally expect them to be. Um, the ECB has been really quite supportive overall. And you know, I think from those two, there will be some payback and um, that's going to be one challenge for, for Italy. But also, I think that compared to what we expected, even just a few months ago, rates, rates have gone up much more quickly and the policy rate is expected to go up more quickly. And quantitative easing is being switched off more quickly. And so you know, what is being asked of all the other kinds of investors who might plug the, the gap as the ECB goes away for, for Italy is um, it's really quite a radical change in behavior quite quickly. And although the prices have moved um, accordingly, I don't think a lot of these people move necessarily as quickly as the market can. And so I think that there could be you know, some sort of difficulty with that adjustment overall. And you were asking about the you know, the financial fragmentation, um, you know, which is, in a sense, the ECB's way of saying um, that they you know, have a duty to protect spreads uh, to some extent, uh, particularly if they're in some way, in some sense, you know, moves that are unjustified or too volatile. And I think that we're, we're getting pretty close to, um, to, to that. And it's not just Italy by any stretch of the imagination. And you know, it's also been a very challenging environment in, in in stocks and credit, um, although I'll note that um, you know, maybe things were looking a little bit better in, um, in in credit, possibly just because you know with some of the volatility and the uh, and the pessimism on the growth side, on the down so sort of the, you know, this sort of downside risks um, being accentuated in the market's mind. Um, yeah we had a bit of a rally and I think that people are starting to be a little bit reassured by the possibility that uh, the rates might come, come lower. But listen, um, I think that, yeah, uh, we really need to see the ECB uh, being a little bit more explicit about how it might try to, um, to, to protect spreads. And to be honest with you, I struggle to see them actually doing that in, you know, before before the June meeting and possibly before the July meeting, and it may not even be until later. So I think at the moment, we have a pretty negative um, uh, mix for, uh, for periphery. So I guess that that um, brings us to the UK, Imogen, um, where last week we recorded right after the 
Bank of England meeting. And at the time you were talking lots and lots about steepening risks and so on. And um, that has been entirely vindicated. Um, so how are you feeling about things now? Yes, we did. We recorded, well, yeah, pretty much straight after. And, and to be honest, there hasn't been a whole lot of new information, you know, UK specific information since then. Um, we haven't had a whole host of data or much, um, you know, central bank speak really that, that has moved markets. So, you know, really our, our views haven't changed. I guess I would echo what Jan has been saying that in these kind of, well, with rates having moved as far and as fast as they have, and, and with this level of volatility, it's much harder to be or have as much conviction in the kind of outright duration view as, as we did have perhaps a couple of months ago. So I would say our conviction definitely lies in the steepener, although we are still kind of marginally bearish at the longer end of the curve. Um, and that, you know, really is mostly driven by something that, that well, you've just talked about for Europe and we've talked about on this podcast lots of times before around the front end of the UK still pricing in much too much, we think, in terms of the Bank of England's reaction function. Um, the curve, or, or some of that, has been priced out since the, the meeting last week and, and since we spoke last, but we still think that there's much further to go. You know, we haven't updated our base case call for only one additional hike this year. Um, most likely in August. I think the risks are skewed to the upside. I think, you know, we definitely sit at the more dovish end of expectations. But even then, I think we're talking perhaps about just one more hike. So, you know, 50 basis points of hikes this year at the most, uh, whereas the market has, you know, one 25 basis point hike priced in at each of the next three meetings and more beyond that. So there's this significant kind of gap, I suppose, versus what we're expecting and, and what the market has priced in. So at the front end, I think, you know, being long two year or, or receiving one year, one year, those kind of um, trades make, make a lot of sense. And further out the curve, um, like I say, we still hold this kind of marginally bearish view. Regular listeners will know that we have this 2% target in gilts that we're kind of range trading around a little bit at the moment, to be honest. Um, every time we sort of reach or breach that level, we seem to have, you know, rally back to closer to kind of 180. Um, so you know, as we're recording today, we, we sit under that 2% target. So puts us on the marginally bearish side. But I would say probably, you know, even beyond 2%, I think there's scope for, for yields to go a little bit higher, particularly as long as they price in such a hawkish reaction function from the Bank of England. Um, and, you know, that it's not just about what we think about the Bank of England, but there's also the whole supply uh, and demand dynamic, which we've talked about a, a lot on this call, this idea that quantitative tightening we think is coming, um, probably not until next year. But again, last week's meeting didn't change our view on that. Um, but even without active selling, the kind of supply equation changes quite a lot this year and in the years ahead um, for investors, you know, the, the net duration that's left for, for them to absorb rather than the Bank of England is grows quite significantly this year. And that's also, you know, with a baseline of uh, the uh, remit numbers that, that were updated only a couple of weeks ago. And really, again, I think risks to those numbers are skewed to the upside, particularly when we talk about um, the cost of living crisis in the UK and the potential for more fiscal policy um, to support the consumer there as we go head into the second half of this year. And for the years ahead, you know, next year we'll also be heading into a pre-election year. In any case, the numbers that the OBR published or, you know, looked quite optimistic at the time, but especially when you kind of compare those numbers to the Bank of England's forecast last week, they look even more optimistic. And so definitely on, on the supply side, I think your numbers for this year and for the years ahead are kind of skewed to the upside. So um, we're quite happy kind of remaining bearish um, further out the curve. So we've been holding our steepness in kind of twos, tens, or one year, one year, ten year, short ten year gilts, um, and as you mentioned, that that has performed well over the last week or so, you know, into and out of the Bank of England meeting. Um, but I think that there's still significantly more juice in that trade. As I just think there's so much still to be priced out at the front end when it comes to rate hike expectations in the UK. Okay, and alongside the, I guess the um, US CPI, uh, UK GDP is probably one of the focuses for for this week as well. Isn't it? So, um, maybe if you could just run us through your expectation for that. 
<laughs> well, when I say mine, I really mean Ross's. <laughs> um, but taking Ross's forecast, um, you know, he's penciled in 0.1% uh, month on month growth in March, which is, I guess, kind of in line with the trend uh, and gives a quarterly print for Q1 of 1%. So um, I think that's in line with consensus and suggests you know, as I say, trend-like levels of growth. Um, but really for markets, I think that they'll be looking ahead to uh, more what forward-looking indicators are suggesting about growth in the quarters to come, because um, I guess, you know, we're much more concerned about the impact to the consumer of the cost of living crisis with still high inflation over the coming months and expect that weakness to come in the second half of this year. So although I think, you know, the print that we get well, we're recording this on Wednesday, so we'll get it tomorrow, but I'm sure a lot of listeners, it will be out by the time that uh, a lot of listeners actually listen to this podcast. Uh, so we'll very quickly be proved wrong or right. But um, I think the market reaction will probably be fairly muted, given that this is mostly, you know, given the, the pace at which the kind of economic backdrop is changing and, and the risks are growing. This is pretty outdated information compared to how we see it unfolding uh, going forwards. And so on that note, I guess we can wrap up there. Look forward to the data print tomorrow. Uh, and I'm sure we can discuss that in more detail next week. Uh, thank you both for joining me. Thank you to all of our listeners for listening in. And just a reminder that if you liked today's episode, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe so you can get the latest episode as soon as they're available. Thanks. See you next week. Bye.